Most of the more than 350 million people living in North America today have very little to do with the military. Even though there are 2.6 million veterans in the U.S. who have returned from Afghanistan and Iraq, and about 40,000 in Canada who fought in Afghanistan, their stories are often pushed to the back of our collective minds, where they reside with our doubts about the viability of the missions those soldiers were sent to fight. Many of them have returned wounded and not only visibly so. The wounds they brought back with them have also been caused by moral injuries. Nancy Sherman has written a book about this phenomenon. It's called After War, Healing the Moral Wounds of Our Soldiers. And she joins us now on the line from Washington, D.C. Professor Sherman, uh, I do want to start with that notion of, of moral wounds. We certainly understand physical wounds. We understand even mental or psychological wounds. You're talking about moral wounds. What's the difference? So moral wounds is uh, a part of psychological injury, and it's the anguish that uh, folks, it doesn't have to be soldiers, but those are the, those are the ones we're focusing on here, uh, suffer uh, as a result of transgressions that they may have uh, incurred or may have been done to them or were their close-up witnesses. And, uh, or it can be falling short of ideals. Again, they as agents or victims or, or others that they're really close to. And it's expressed in ordinary emotions we know very well, like resentment, guilt, shame. And, and it, I think the major difference that we need to focus on is that post-traumatic stress disorder, the major psychological injury associated with war, often is narrowly focused on fear, life threat, and getting disabled by uh, being subjected all the time to life threat. Psychological injuries are broader and they include a sense of just having your morality and moral, stand, moral bearing kind of shattered. Can you just amplify on that a bit so, uh, and help us with the connection if there is one between moral wounds and PTSD? How do you see it? Sure, so PTSD may be in the minds of many includes moral injuries, but narrowly in terms of a diagnosis, it's often been restricted to being uh, uh, injured really by constant pervasive threat. Uh, soldiers, especially in these current wars, are under a lot of threat. Moral injury factors on the, per the kinds of ideas, Am I, was I a good enough soldier? Did I let down my troops? Was the war I'm fighting just? was that collateral incident where I killed a child or, or an innocent, which may have been legally uh, permissible, still yet feels morally permissible. So it's navigating the murky moral morass, and war has no shortage of that kind of moral complexity and, and quandary. Hmm. We are going to sprinkle in throughout our conversation here this evening some uh, examples of videos of what you're talking about and I'd like to play the first one right now this is a lieutenant as we say in Canada lieutenant Dan Bershinsky uh, your book after war is replete with stories of people who have come home with moral wounds and uh, this clip will demonstrate the kind of profound feelings of guilt and loss that he experienced as a result of his time in the military let's play this clip and then we'll chat again roll tape please this weekend is about my forward observer, Jonathan Yanni. 20-year-old Jonathan Yanni of Litchfield, Minnesota. As my forward observer, I trusted Yanni to talk to the helicopters that made gun runs danger close to my platoon when we were in contact with the enemy. I trusted Yanni to talk to the artillery that shot rounds over our heads and into the enemy's positions. And in return, Yanni trusted me to make the decisions that would control his life in a combat zone. And so on August 18th, 2009, seven or eight hours before I stepped on the explosive that took my legs, third platoon of my battalion's Alpha Company was ambushed. I took Yanni's and the rest of my platoon's trust, and I led my men away from town and into a pomegranate orchard. I sent a squad across a small footbridge waited for them to get into position and then I moved across the bridge with my radio man walking right next to me and Yanni walking as every good infantryman knows to do three to five meters behind me close enough to get to me should I need him to call in support but far enough away to not take out another soldier should an explosion occur under or near Yanni 
And that's where Yanni was, three to five meters behind me, when he stepped on the trigger of an improvised explosive device. Within a hundredth of a second, the front half of my platoon was thrown face down into the Afghan dirt, and Yanni and his trust were taken away forever. Professor Sherman, what you clearly can see and hear in that is a man who is uh, deeply conflicted and struggling with uh, his role in the death of his friend and colleague. What you couldn't see so much in that picture was that um, he lost both his legs and he has a reconstructed left arm. Is it enough to just say to a man like that, look, you shouldn't be feeling any moral wounds at all. You did your best. You paid a high price. That's life. Well, I think that kind of response is really deleterious, and it is exactly not the response you want. Soldiers like Dan Brzezinski, whom I know very well, now re retired from the military and, uh, and doing remarkably well, uh, is a good soldier in part because he feels the anguish of losing his, his buddy Danny. And in his own case, um, Reckoning with that in a way that's you know has, in a way that's not necessarily destructive but constructive it has been very very helpful. He lost half of his body, uh, he, yet he's a soldier of hope in a certain way. So Dan's an interesting case. He in that clip clearly feels the devastation of loss. In fact, he lost his bottom half by retrieving the body parts of his observer. Hmm. Would it be fair to say uh, that his sense of moral wound uh, or guilt would be even more profound had he not sustained injuries himself? That's a good, uh, a good question, but I think that might have been the case. He, there would have been a sense of cowardice and enormous shame uh, of not putting himself on the line in order to, um, or not so much on the line, but, but, but suffering something from this loss. He also is very much aware that others may feel some moral anguish and in, in having invisible wounds while he so clearly has lost uh, half of his body. He's really hmm. got only the upper torso. Um, and yet he uh, has a remarkable disposition. He's an individual who has struggled with uh, moral and physical wounds and has came, come out strong. How much survivor guilt did you see among those you spoke to? A lot of survivor guilt, and that's one way of talking about moral injury. Uh, but in addition to survivor guilt, there's also uh, sometimes a shame that they just couldn't do more, for example, to uh, help civilians. Uh, and in part, there's also a lot of anger that part of the reason they couldn't do more is because they were with very corrupted partners. Uh, in the case of one guy I talked to, Major Hall, um, he both had a commander that wasn't giving him resources to do what he had to do, which is essentially bury civilian bodies uh, in Iraq. And he was also working with the Iraqi Defense Ministry and Health Ministry in those early days after the siege of Baghdad, 2000, after 2003, where he was between a rock and a hard place. And he had lost his resources, which was to kill and destroy the enemy. He couldn't do that. That's what he was going to do in Baghdad. He was essentially going to build cities and lay sewers and help civilians. But in that activity, which is what a good person can do, help the civilians who are non-combatants caught in the, often in the crosshairs of fire, he got hampered. And so his moral injury was shame that he couldn't be a better man and enormous anger that the resources weren't there, including from command and partnerships that would allow him to do that. Well, let's compare and contrast for a second then, because I know you thought that uh, Brzezinski was a uh, resilient uh, guy with a good temperament, and he is dealing with his moral wounds in the best way he can. What about those who aren't so resilient and don't have that kind of temperament? How do they deal with it? Well, that's a great question. The, um, the best, uh, well, a number of ways. One is that it really needs to be recognized that uh, even if crippling fear and hypervigilance and sort of flashbacks um, are the presenting symptoms, there may also be a sense of, as we were speaking, guilt and shame. And that may come out later, only when someone has kind of stabilized a little bit. In my experience, the 
critical aspect is having someone who really is empathetic and compassionate, a kind of angel at home. Not everyone has those kinds of uh, relationships, be they uh, marital or, 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 or parental. Dan was surrounded also uh, by remarkable set of parents um, and, uh, and a girlfriend at the time. Um, <laughs> But uh, others really need kind of almost an angel. Um, and that, and in addition, there has to be institutional resources that uh, understand that moral injury is a, fl is a kind of uh, psychological injury, often that emerges slowly and, and uh, has to do with the enormous uh, sense of accountability soldiers have. And I think it's a, sh a huge issue for civilians. We need to do more than just say, thank you for your service. We need to recognize that the conversations are going to be hard and slow and deep, and we need to find ways that we can engage that aren't shallow or hollow. This may go without saying, but let's just nail it down just in case. I presume this is something that they feel internally. There, there aren't people on the outside who are going to them and saying, shame on you for what you did during the war. Is that right? I think that's right, but I think there's also a sense um, you're right, in the shaming often is highly um, self-imposed. Um, but to some degree, I think that there's um, a, sense, a culture in the military, too, that you should be all and, and do all. And also at places like West Point, the Naval Academy where I taught, there's a sense that um, officers are always held up to the highest standards. We see this in Greek tragedy as well. You know, a, the, the sense of honor and the sense of being able to be perfect almost in a really highly imperfect environment where there's only one wrong and another wrong um, plays on soldiers. So I think you have to realize the, uh, that shame is, it is kind of set up for feeling shame in these difficult um, moral situations and also because of the culture, the ethos of the military um, that combines high ideals with sometimes a zero defect policy, don't make mistakes because you're always dealing with lives and lives on the line. Um, so yeah, people may not be going shame, shame, shame on you, but you, there's a lot of conditions in place for internalization of shame. Hmm. To that end, I want to read a brief excerpt from your book, After War. Uh, here goes. For the individual soldier, acknowledging moral injury often requires coming to feel the fine grain of the emotions and conceptualizing the moral implications for honor and dignity. It is not easy for those committed to lives of action and combat readiness to explore the interior of the self. It can feel narcissistic, indulgent, a way of dodging real work, a kind of malingering. How do we get them not to feel that way about this and to and, and to, you know, for lack of a better word, to indulge in the important self-analysis that will help them be happier and deal with their moral wounds. Well, I think one of the big messages has to come from commanders. Uh, those who have power over young folks or subordinates uh, have to realize that they need to refer people to help or at least have very open conversations. We're dealing with a male, predominantly male culture and women also who often want to outbro the bros in order to be tough and, and um, not carry a kind of uh, perceived weakness. And so there has to be leading by from command, that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that there also has to be uh, a recognition which many of us in the public just may take for granted. Well, of course these are hard situations. But for soldiers who always have to be there for someone else and cover each other's back, uh, there has to be more recognition that you, can, that you can only do so much and that your agency gets crimped by moral luck. So some of it is kind of slow deliberation. Those of us in the classroom have an enormous privilege and I guess obligation as well to be able to talk about these issues over 13 weeks when it is our subject and um, open up the conversation for people that are might withdraw and not want to talk about their personal issues before others. Let's talk about some of the ramifications of these moral wounds and that is if you go back many decades, once upon a time let's say, the suicide rate among members of the military was lower than the general population. Ever since, I think about 2004, with uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, George W. Bush's incursion into Iraq, 
That's changed. The numbers have gone way up among military personnel. In your view, how much of that has to do with the moral wounds soldiers come home with? I think a lot does. I think the complication is certainly the moral wounds, but I wouldn't want to isolate. I think we're dealing with a, um, a, a panoply of, of factors. Another is you've got a lot of folks going to war who are young. These are young minds. They're young morally and emotionally. They often uh, don't have the most stable uh, home situations. It's not all of them, but you know, it, and some are married um, with or uh, uh, attached, where these are fragile attachments and uh, um, not always the most supportive in complicated um, situations. So you've got a lot going on. The numbers also tend to misrepresent because the veteran population is huge. It, my dad died at 89, a veteran. Um, when they're doing the trackings of these suicide rates, they're talking about all veterans, so from this war as well as uh, those, in my dad's case, World War II. So let's just understand that for a second. I, I, I don't know how your father died. I presume it was not a suicide. Not a suicide at all. No, if, natural, very slow natural death. Okay, but if, if, let's say, a World War II vet decided to take his own life at the age of 80, would that be recorded as a war-related yeah. death? Well, it's not so much the war-related debt, but there's been a statistic around that is about 23 veterans commit suicide a day. And that does carry, that is the whole expanse of who is a veteran, which in the United States could be someone from 17 or 18, 18 up through, uh, I don't know if there are any, you know, a World War II vet and, and um I, I don't think we have many World War I vets around anymore. Right, right. I, I don't know what the numbers are like in the United States, but I know that in Canada there are as many, if not more, soldiers who took their own lives after having come home from serving in Afghanistan as there were soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan. What do we yeah. infer from those numbers? I think that the real issue here is that stigma attached to seeking mental health is still out there. It's phenomenal, but it is pervasive. And the inability and reluctance to get treatment is still a, ling a, a, a major public policy issue. And we, so too are firearms. Um, you know, it's an issue I always think about when folks come home, they're having trouble, I speak to them, not clinically, but uh, by the by, those are in my purview as, as uh, students or, or colleagues or friends. And it's very hard to raise the question about what are they carrying, what's in the house, um, what kind of meds are still on uh, that, that they have that might be dangerous. So I think firearms definitely is a huge issue and lots and lots of um, um, meds that need to be collected. This was an issue that came up in the Suicide Review Board I sat on uh, under um, General Peter Corelli when he convened that. Um, it's very hard to monitor. We're now, you know, looking carefully at biomarkers, um, whether we can get these or not, but it's, uh, it's an issue to see where the predictive factors are. And I know that there's big data coming into this. It won't solve all problems, but it would be very good to see collections of predictive factors that allow us to monitor individuals better. Hmm. I mentioned earlier we're going to sprinkle our conversation with some video clips of some of the people that you know about. Let's take a look at another. Here's Captain Josh Metz. Roll the clip, please. My name is Captain Joshua Motz, and I've been in the military for five years. I was deployed to Iraq from October of 2006 to January of 2008. It was the most pivotal time in the Iraq War. Uh, it's when we made a cognizant shift uh, from high intensity operations to counterinsurgency operations. Our responsibility was to win the hearts and minds of the local population. Josh was injured in Sadr City. He and his platoon sergeant were standing side by side and a bullet ricocheted through that staff sergeant and into Josh Monch's leg. And so that's really the core of what happened in that incident where one soldier was lost, but Josh was able to survive. Because the bullet hit me, I had the luxury of getting medevaced all the way back to Walter Reed Army Medical Center. Every single step of that medevac process, from my 19-year-old medic on the ground to the brigade surgeon who continued to work on me for 15 straight minutes after I was flatlined. And it goes on. The point that I'm getting at here is 
Our physically wounded soldiers have streamlined access to the best medical care in the world. And because of that, when I was at Walter Reed, I had clinical psychologists walking into my room about every four hours, simply trying to get me to talk about what happened. And they try to pull a little bit more out of me each day. Um, and what that did, it was preventative medicine. Um, it's a basic principle of psychology. The earlier and more often you talk about a traumatic experience, the faster you will recover from it. Professor Sherman, how does Josh's case fit in with the theme of your book in your view? Well, Josh is remarkable. He said to me straight up when I first met him, it, you know, it, what hurt me most was moral injury and not uh, some of the other uh, traumas that, and traumatic stressors he faced. He um, survived his, um, his, because the medic chose him because he had a viable wound and his, um, his sergeant Harper um, died uh, when that same bullet went through, um, through his aorta, but I think in Josh's case it was a femoral wound uh, through his thigh. And Josh not only survived, he went on to be a, a kind of poster boy resilience uh, 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 speaker for the Department of Defense. What's fascinating about Josh is somewhere in the middle of that, he himself had his personal breakdown. You don't see it in that clip, but he, he got to Walter Reed at some point again, uh, not just because of his physical injuries, but because of his psychological injuries. And he talks very openly about this. And, he, and those came in part when he was doing resilience work with troops, figuring out how to get them to talk and in Fort Riley, Kansas. And um, he, um, he overloaded on, on other people's anguish and his own that hadn't been really resolved. And were it not for his initial openness to being, to talking to psychologists and then himself sort of practicing psychology with troops, I don't think he'd be here today. Hmm. If he you, if flirted a soldier, with suicide. He did. How, 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 yeah. did how, how is it that he ultimately didn't take that decision? Well, one of his buddies who was uh, features in the book, um, uh, also, Major Jeff Hall um, got a phone call from Josh and had him speak to someone. Um, and that individual uh, at Walter Reed was remarkable in his uh, um, stabilizing. Hmm. Uh, it was a long personal conversation. And he's, um, you know, he, he was open to it, ready, but he had to hit the bottom before he reached out. He sure. had to hit the bottom before he reached out. And it, I have to say one more thing about Josh. He uh, wanted very badly after he survived his physical wounds to get back to the battle line. An old story, sort of like um, um, Sassoon in World War I. I hear the soldiers calling out to me, where are you? When are you coming back to the, to the front? And similarly for Josh, he fixed his records a bit. He had some Crohn's disease, which he now speaks about, uh, made that go away. <laughs> and got back to the, to the front um, in order to do his work. You, you get a sense of the perfection that can drive these individuals. Hmm. So, uh, well, let me follow up on that. If, if you believe deeply in the morality of your cause and you believe in the rightness of what you're doing, either militarily or in terms of, as he put it, winning the hearts and minds, does that reduce the moral wound when you come home? Well. Josh is an interesting case because he's a, a, a kid who studied counterinsurgency when he was in high school, uh, very interested, studied uh, Arabic and counterinsurgency at West Point, and is one of the few individuals who, that I know really believes in it deeply. Um, but he also knows that in order for it to work, you have to have ideal conditions, which never were the case in where he served in Iraq and, uh, um, and, and, or, uh, and in Afghanistan. Um, and he knew that he was dealing with a very, very stressed population, a population that has PTSD. And he had to often have conversations with his troops about the plausibility of counterinsurgency, even though he had his own doubts. So I'm sure that played into um, the sense of futility that he came home with. It wasn't just survivor guilt, but the very, very fraught circumstances of counterinsurgency play on your um, moral sense of, of, of um, purpose and, uh, and uh, commitment. And uh, if you, for example, were to 
as a soldier, kill somebody who is innocent. You, you, you know, barged into a home, you thought you were looking for a terrorist, and said you saw some, you know, you saw a mother with her kid, and for whatever reason took their lives. Does that, does that moral wound stay with you forever, or can you get over it? I think for many it stays with you. It's hard to give a general prescription for, you know, there's no universal soldier. And I have to say, for some soldiers, simply killing justly uh, where the conditions are strong, but you know, where you really believe it's a just war and you believe that it's proportionate and discriminate, that it's just conduct, um, it, that kind of situation for some can un, you know, uh, unleash all sorts of moral injuries because it feels philosophically, if you even get to that point of thinking about it, it seems to make sense. You've probably never been taught about just war theory in the case of most soldiers. But psychologically, it feels so cognitively dissonant. So there's a strong argument for not only, uh, you know, yes, teach officers about philosophical foundations of war and just war theory, but also teach troops, the rank and file, how to deal with killing in general, whether it's fully justified, and again, those conditions can be, have to be discussed, or it's not justified and it's uh, uh, um, accident or, um, or misidentification or, you know, an order that you followed that might have been lawful but nonetheless was um, immoral. Hmm. In our last few minutes here, I want to play one more clip. I gather that when uh, soldiers are off to get therapy, they call it uh, going to see the wizard. And uh, yes. we're going to play a little, uh, we're going to play a clip here of a new kind of therapy. It was developed by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Let's play that clip and then we'll come back and chat. Roll it, please. Hi there. The name's William Ford, but you can call me Bill. Welcome to SimCoach. Hi, Bill. So what's SimCoach? SimCoach is a safe place for war fighters and their families to talk about the things that are on their minds. So who are you? I'm a virtual human, which means that I'm based on the real experiences and personalities of actual war fighters and their families. Anyway, I'm here to listen, and I'm here to help. Anything you want to talk about? Talk to you? How do I do that? Well, you're doing it right now. Just type in regular English. Anything troubling you? If there is, why would I want to talk to you about it? Well, here, I'll tell you what. I made a video that tells you a little bit more. I'm going to pop it up over here on the right. Not all the wounds of war are physical. When you don't dress a wound, it gets worse, doesn't it? SimCoach is here to talk about the issues weighing on your mind without worrying about anyone finding out about it. Do you think SimCoach can actually work better than talking to a real person? Better, I'm not sure. For some people, it's a, it's a gateway. Uh, it uh, keeps things private and familiar, given a lot of people spend a lot of time when they come home staring at a boob tube or playing video games uh, and essentially engaging in virtual reality of all sorts. So it, it can be a lifesaver. It may get you beyond uh, or, or into the door, so to speak, uh, transition you through screening uh, to find resources, to be able to, once you practice a bit, to be able to open up to others and, uh, and the like. There are other kinds of virtual reality uh, uh, mechanisms out there uh, that simulate what you've been through that have their advantages as well. I think ultimately building relationships when, especially when you come home from war and for some it feels like your ability to relate has just flattened out entirely and you can't connect uh, who you are, who you were, and make the relationship with your, yourself and also relate to the folks you left back home and the folks that are now part of your uh, re-entry and homecoming. So I, it can be a, a, a portal, literally, <laughs> a portal into society uh, and into seeking help. Um, it's likely not the last point. And in our last minute here, I do want to ask you about those who come home morally wounded and what they think about the fact that despite their efforts, Iraq is a mess, Afghanistan is fill-in-the-blank, fragile, also a mess, challenging, difficult, whatever. 
What do they think about that? This has to play on their sense of purpose and moral purpose and uh, loss. Uh, many that I know that served in Iraq, um, for example, Fallujah, Mosul, uh, places dominated by ISIS right now and the ISIS threat, um, are absolutely um, morally bothered by it. Those in high places who are officers who consult with the state are amongst the most conservative now in term, or dovish in terms of no more, it, troops aren't the answer. They know, the military folks at the highest levels know the complexities of war and that it's not going to be an easy, uh, easy solution. And they know it also deeply psychologically. They've faced a lot of losses. They worry that they might have been futile and um, they're retelling their own stories about what it was for and, and what it was, how worthwhile it was. Hmm. The name of the book is After War, Healing the Moral Wounds of Our Soldiers. Philosophy professor at Georgetown University, Nancy Sherman, has been our guest. We're so grateful you came on TVO with us tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.